Today we'll be going over an orthopedic hip examination. And the first thing we'll start out with would be a history. So when interviewing the patient, you're gonna listen for any traumas that may have occurred, if the patient has noticed any swelling, any changes in skin, redness, uh, any deformity in, in the joint that they came in to have you examine. You're gonna listen for perhaps a bursitis. There might be some tenderness, swelling, maybe some redness in an area. Listen for tendinopathies, any painful tendons or snapping, something that the patient will tell you about in that area. You're also gonna think arthropathies. You know, are they describing a deformed or, or a single joint that is, is quite tender or sore? Or maybe a, a rheumatoid arthropathy where it might be a redness, some heat coming off the joint, maybe affecting smaller joints. You're also going to listen to possible signs of maybe an infection if the patient has mentioned that they've had a fever or they've noticed an exudate or redness swelling in a certain area. And you're also going to have to run through the differential in your mind as you're listening to of crystal forming arthropathies. Perhaps they have one joint that's quite tender and swollen, uh, a little bit of heat coming off of it again, skin changes, you might think gout or pseudogout. So we can't emphasize how important history is. It's the first part of the examination and it's going to guide your examination and give you all the clues that you need to investigate when you're looking at a patient. One of the first things that we should consider is the location of pain. So in this case, if the patient has described an anterior hip pain, we have to run through a differential in our mind. Anterior hip pain could be suggestive of the joint itself, osteoarthritic changes, uh, fractures, such as a femoral neck fracture. We could also think septic arthritis, thinking of a femoral acetabular uh, syndrome, FAS, an impingement that may occur. We can also think of uh, neurological things. If there's a burning sensation, loss of sensation on the front, the anterior or the lateral aspect of the thigh, we can think neuralgia parasthetica, which would be a uh, entrapment of the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. So depending on the location that the patient is pain, uh, pointing to, that's gonna start your thought process in terms of what this might be. Now, if the location of the hip pain is on the lateral aspect, then we're thinking of a different differential. First off, we start to think of greater trochanteric pain syndrome, which could be referred pain from the joint itself. It could be an abductor tendinopathy, or even pain from the internal deep stabilizers of the hip. We could also think of pain right at the greater trochanter as trochanteric bursitis, or if the patient describes a snapping sensation, we could think of external snapping hip syndrome. Now lastly, if the patient is complaining of posterior hip pain, then we have to think of the lumbar spine itself, the SI joint, or the hip itself as generators of pain. Most commonly in this area, we'll see a lumbar radiculopathy. We may see sacroiliitis, or even a deep gluteal or piriformis syndrome. Next, we'll be looking at a general observation and inspection of the patient. Starting out with the anterior view, we're going to landmark the ASIS, the anterior superior iliac spines on either side. So it'd be here and here. And then we're going to observe looking downwards at the general stance. We're looking at the knees to see if there's a genu valgus perhaps, a knock kneed position, which would also probably go along with pronated feet. That could be an indication that there may be weaker inhibited gluteal muscles. The opposite, as we look down, if this was more of a bowing out, a genu varus, feet would probably be supinated and higher arches here, pes cavus perhaps, where you'd have a raised uh, longitudinal arch. In that case, we actually may have shortened and contracted gluteal muscles. So looking at the front, we're taking all those things into consideration. Next, we'll observe the posterior view. Here we're using the PSISs as landmarks, so the posterior superior iliac spines. We're looking for the gluteal folds to make sure there's symmetry, the folds at the back of the knees as well. We're also looking to see if there's a hike in the pelvis, if one side's higher, another side lower, which would be indicative of potentially tighter, shorter muscles on one side, weak inhibited on the opposite side. Any indication of that could lead into any type of imbalance or asymmetries in movement and in function. Lastly, we'll look at a lateral view. And what we're observing here is whether there's an anterior or posterior pelvic tilt. I'm gonna use my hand to demonstrate. So an anterior tilt would be the top of the pelvis forward. This would indicate potentially shortened QL or hip flexor muscles. 
It will increase lumbar lordosis, creating more pressure and compression in the low back. It will also inhibit the gluteal muscles or is indicative of potentially weakened gluteal muscles that are not countering the hip flexor on the opposite side. Now, if we go the opposite way, this would be a posterior tilt. And as you can see, it flattens out the lumbar spine and the gluteal muscles shorten and contract. Either of these positions can lead to abnormal hip motion and potentially dysfunction. Next would be palpation. From the anterior aspect, we're gonna palpate the ASIS on either side. We're always comparing left and right when doing this. Then coming downwards, we're going to find the greater trochanter on either side. And then visually, we're inspecting and palpating as we're going down to the lateral malleoli. If we were to measure, we draw a line from the ASIS all the way down to the lateral malleolus, and we would compare left and right. Next, we'll be palpating from the posterior aspect. First off, we're finding the posterior superior iliac spines on either side, once again, comparing left and right, the PSISs. Next, we're moving to the greater trochanters on either side. In the midline here, we'd have the sacrum. Follow that down. And from here, we're gonna to go to the ischial tuberosities. Uh, Lindsay, is it okay if we palpate ischial tubes? Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna go right side, left side. There are the ischial tuberosities. If we use the ischial tuberosity as a landmark, and then the sacrum as a landmark, running from the ischial tuberosity to the sacrum would be the sacrotuberous ligament. So we're gonna palpate that. Once again, we're checking both sides. So we're palpating here again. And then lastly, if we use the ischial tuberosities as landmarks and the greater trochanters on the external aspect here, midpoint between the two would be the sciatic nerve. So here's the ischial tuberosity, trochanter, midpoint. If we follow it down into the biceps, we could pass, ah, sorry, biceps femoris is what I'm trying to say. We'd palpate sciatic nerve, or we could follow it up into the deep gluteal musculature as well. Next, we're moving on to active range of motion and passive range of motion, starting out with hip flexion. The range should be roughly 110 degrees to 120 degrees of flexion. Starting out, you'd want the patient to actively flex the non-symptomatic side. So, for the sake of this video, we'll only be demonstrating one side, but in an actual examination, you'd want to do both and compare the two. So, Let's say that uh, Lindsay suffering from right hip pain. We'll start on the left here. So Lindsay, flex that left hip. There you go. At the end range here, I'm going to apply some overpressure, passively moving it further into flexion. Good. Yeah. And back. So if pain were generated during this movement, we'd have to think of the primary muscles involved. The primary hip flexors would be the iliopsoas, rectus femoris, and sartorius muscles. Pain here could be indicative of a hip flexor tendinopathy, perhaps osteoarthritis, or some type of femoral acetabular impingement. So while performing these, run through that differential diagnosis in your mind. Now let's look at internal and external hip rotation. So Lindsay, first off, we're gonna bring the knee into about 90 degrees of flexion and the hip into 90 degrees of flexion. And I want you to create an internal rotation. So your foot will be moving outwards this way. Okay, so go for it there. Great, and I'm gonna apply some overpressure here. So any pain or resistance here that, that might elicit symptoms, we'd be thinking of osteoarthritis of the joint. Now coming back to neutral here, and that would be roughly a range of 30 to 40 degrees of internal rotation would be normal. Now let's go the other way, external rotation. Okay, now I'm gonna apply some overpressure again. So here we're looking at about 40 to 60 degrees of external rotation would be normal. And once again, if there's any pain elicited or symptoms elicited, once again, we'd be thinking osteoarthritis or some type of degeneration of the hip. Now, while we're here and Lindsay's in the supine position, this is the position where we can do some hip circumduction. And now what that is, is bringing that hip into the extreme ranges here. So we're gonna come do this hip rotation this way we're going to bring it back and all the way through so as you can see we're getting into those end ranges of hip movement now any discomfort in that position could possibly be suggestive of a labral tear now let's look at abduction and adduction so abduction and adduction of the hip starting out with abduction 
I want you to move your leg as far out as you can towards me this way, keeping it in the, in the, oh, let's start again. So don't bring it up into flexion, but try to keep it in this plane of movement. Okay, so let's come out this way. Perfect, so normal ranges would be about 30 to 50 degrees. As we can see, Lindsay's a lot more flexible than that. At end range, we're gonna stabilize the opposite ASIS, and we're gonna bring this further into abduction. Yeah, you're almost at 90 degrees there, so it's pretty impressive. Now, we're gonna go back, and now we're gonna do adduction, so adduction. On this one, you wanna bring your leg that way. So I'm gonna raise this one to get out of the way, and bring your leg across. Normal range here would be about 30 degrees. And once again, you're quite flexible, so we're gonna bend your knee here. I'm going to stabilize the outside of the leg here, and I'm gonna push it further into adduction. Okay, good. Okay, and go back to neutral here and relax. And lastly, we'll examine the active range of motion and passive range of motion of hip extension. So patient is prone. Something that you should consider and that we do in clinic is stabilizing the lumbar spine. You want to make the movement as purely a hip movement as you can without any compensation further up the chain. So, Lindsay, you're going to keep the leg straight and I want you to, to raise that right leg into extension, hip extension. Good. And then I'm going to take it into a little bit further extension. Perfect. Good. Okay. And once again, always compare both sides. Now let's move on to orthopedic tests of the hip. Uh, before I get started, I'd like to mention Normally we would perform a straight leg raise as part of this examination, but we're not gonna demonstrate that here. If you'd like, we have a video of that already. It's part of our low back examination and we're gonna put a link up in the top right corner. Please click on it and check it out. So the first test we're gonna do here if we suspect a hip fracture is the log rolling test. So basically we're going to create a rolling motion back and forth of the leg and we're looking to see if there's any pain that's elicited higher up in the hip joint. If we suspect that something may be going on there and this motion of rolling back and forth is painful, we're going to test it by doing a compression test. We're gonna gently support the leg and we're gonna hit the bottom of the foot here, trying to compress the leg upwards to elicit a pain response. So we're gonna tap a few times. Another way to do this is we would bend the knee, bringing this up, and this time I'm going to tap straight down on the femur this way. Oh, got a patella reflex there. Okay, so tapping down. And then lastly, we would go to the side of the hip and hit it from a lateral aspect. So we would tap inwards this way. And on each test that we're doing, we're looking to see whether we're eliciting pain at the top of the hip in the joint here. The next test is the Faber test. It's an acronym that stands for Flexion, Abduction, External Rotation. Now this test actually will cover a lot of different uh, potential pathologies. So starting out, you're going to bring the hip into 90 degrees of flexion. You're going to start to abduct and externally rotate. Placing this in a figure four type position across the opposite leg above the knee. You're going to stabilize the opposite ASIS and I'm pushing down on the knee here. Now. What we'd like to see in a negative test is that the knee drops below or is in line with the opposite knee. If it's above that point, this would be considered a positive test. But just because it's a positive test, you still have to do some investigating. You have to find out where the discomfort is because this is a test for the sacroiliac joint, also the hip joint, and the surrounding soft tissue structures. So there could be a lot of different pain generators. So this is the Faber test. Now the next test is the Thomas test. This test is primarily done to check for an iliopsoas contracture or primary hip flexor contracture. Before you start, you want to observe and palpate with your hands and see if there's a hyperlordosis. So if the patient were quite lordotic in this region here, that would be one indication that the hip flexors are already shortened and contracted. What we're gonna have Lindsay do here is you're gonna take this leg, and bring that hip way up into flexion, grab your knee with your hands and pull it in as tight as you can. And you're looking to see if there's any strain or symptoms on the opposite side. And specifically, as you, we can see here, Lindsay's actually quite good, but let's say that this hip flexor were contracted on this side, you would see the leg come up. So patient is pulling up the knee opposite to the side that's being tested. So that is the Thomas test. Now, while we're in the supine position, Let's do a piriformis muscle assessment. 
If you're suspecting piriformis syndrome or deep luteal syndrome, this is how you would check for it. We'd start off with a straight leg test. So we're gonna bring this up like a straight leg test to about 90 degrees. Now, if the symptoms are localized and primarily in the gluteal region, to test that piriformis, we're going to bend the knee, bring the leg into a little bit of adduction and further flexion. So as we do this, we're pulling that piriformis and we're stretching it and it's gonna compress into the sciatic nerve, eliciting a localized pain there, reproducing the patient's symptoms. Good. So that would be a test to do for any suspicion of piriformis syndrome. Now let's look at the Trendelenburg test. And this test is primarily examining the gluteus medius muscle. So you start out with your patient facing away from you, standing. You're gonna get them to stand on one leg. So Lindsay, I want you to hike this right leg up to about 90 degrees, perfect. Now, in Lindsay's case, she's strong, there are no issues, but what a positive test would look like, if there were a problem on this left side, the right side would dip down. And this would be indicative of some type of gluteal medius pathology. And there's a number of things that could occur here, whether it's inhibited, weakened, or if there's a muscle tear. So this would be a positive Trendelenburg on that left side. Now that concludes a basic hip orthopedic examination. What we would do in practice is combine that examination with a lumbar spine orthopedic examination, as well as a lower extremity neurological examination. As we know, hip pathology or hip pain can actually originate elsewhere. So you wanna make sure it's not a radiculopathy or something that's being referred from higher up in the chain. So if you're interested in checking out our videos, please check out our physical examination playlist. Thank you for watching and we'll see you soon.